morning, everyone, and welcome to the 10th Annual Global Health Day Symposium, the title of which, Raising a Healthy Generation. I am Jean Witowski-Wendy, Dean of the School of Public Health and Health Professions at the University of Buffalo. Every year during the first full week of April, the American Public Health Association observes National Public Health Week. The School of Public Health and Health Professions has joined in the celebration this week by hosting a variety of virtual events, including the sixth annual Step Challenge, the third annual Mobile Market Summit, webinars and panels, and today's Global Health Day Symposium. These events are meant to promote public health and provide opportunities for learning and discussion about various health-related topics for our students, faculty, staff, alumni, and members of our community. Every year, the School of Public Health and Health Professions Office of Global Health Initiatives recognizes and organizes the Global Health Day Symposium. And this year, the symposium aims to address the theme of raising a healthy generation and the importance of women, children's, and adolescent health concerns. Dr. Lena Mu, Associate Professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health, is the Director of the Office, and she will now tell you a little bit more about the event and our speakers today. Thank you again for joining us for this symposium and our discussions about global health. Dr. Mu? Thank you so much, Jane. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, Martina. Uh, welcome you all to the symposium. I'm Lina Mu. I'm uh, uh, the director of the Global House Initiative in the School of Public House and the House of Professions. So each year, our office organized the Global House Day uh, symposium during this National Public House Week. Uh, and each year, we're trying to bring together the expert to address important global house uh, issues. In the past, we have talked about substance use, women's house, um, house as a human right, so on and so forth. And this year we're trying to uh, get together and discuss raising a healthy generation. Around this topic, we have very nice set of speaker today. We'll address the issue from different um, aspects, from exposome, uh, air pollution, climate change to social determinants, uh, to house behavior and also COVID-19, how those factors might affect the um, next generation. Uh, hope you all uh, enjoy it. Uh, and next, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Martina uh, Reihide, who is our environmental epidemiologist and the head of the um, ISO Global Childhood and Environmental Program in SPIN. And her research mainly focuses on the impact of environmental exposure on child health and development. Uh, she has numerous, uh, led numerous and national international projects and has published extensively uh, in, the, in the field. Uh, she uh, is the one coordinated the European collaborative project we call the HALIX, the Human Early Life Exposome Project funded by European uh, commission. In this project, she was the one spearheaded the push for um, more holistic uh, exposome approach to study coexisting exposure and their joint effect on molecular response and the uh, child house. She's also the leader of the new ECH 2020 project we call the Acelates, advancing tools for uh, human early life uh, course exposome research and translation. Uh, she has been instrumental in building a network of birth cohort in Europe and resulting in a framework uh, for data sharing and harmonizing around uh, 30 European um, birth record, um, uh, birth cohorts. Now, please join me welcome uh, Professor uh, Reihide and who will address early life exposome from concept to implementation. Um, welcome. Thank you very much for the nice um, introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Um, 
and I hope you can all see this. Please let me know if it's if it's not okay. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to the organizers of this symposium for inviting me um, to talk about our work on the exposome, specifically the early life exposome. And um, I thought today to talk a, a bit about the origins of the exposome um, and its specific features that make it interesting for environmental health research and um, then to look at uh, the implementation of this exposome or at least some first implementations uh, and there i will take as an example um, our own project uh, helix um, which stands for the, the human early life uh, exposome so um to start with um i think i want to start by by drawing our attention um we're drawing our focus to the environmental uh, part of disease causation. So it's it has long been recognized um, that environment or environmental risk factors um, in, in their widest sense, so also not just including environmental pollutants, but also diets and lifestyle um, are important and and I have an important contribution uh, to the causation of major um, non-communicable diseases. Uh, and this is, uh, this is from a publication of 20 years ago, which uh, already said that various lines of evidence indicate that environmental factors are most important compared to genetic factors. And, and that there is a, a large percentage of avoidable uh, causes in, in these diseases. So moving from that to pollution, um, it's clear that the impact of many pollution, pollutants or chemical pollutants uh, on health um, is, is hard to estimate. Um, and, and I specifically want you to look at this pyramid, which is from the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, their report on the global burden of disease and it shows very clearly that there are well characterized health effects of well studied pollutants and those are the ones that are included in health impact assessments for example the gbd uh, estimates and, and there they estimate that nine million uh, there are nine million pollution related deaths for example of which around nearly one million are would be in children but I think most more importantly, there is this whole base of the pyramid, which are the zone, what they call here, the zone two or zone three pollutants or associations um, for which estimates are not included in the, in the global burden of disease. And that is because the health effects may be emerging, but not quantified yet or not um, well enough established and so those data could not be included in in gbd calculations or they are inadequately characterized um, and, and and often we're talking about emerging emerging pollutants here so it is important to remember that there's a large cocktail of chemicals um, that are produced to which we are exposed but for which we just don't have um, good enough data on health effects yeah in, in in its widest sense and there we can think about cocktails of of, of chemicals present in, in many consumer products uh, pesticides air pollutants uh, etc and their statement from from this report and a related report is that the full impact of pollution especially chemical pollution on the global burden of disease including pediatric disease is not yet known but is almost certainly undercounted because the pattern of the patterns of chemical exposures are not well charted. So that means we don't know enough about these cocktails of, of exposures and the potential toxicity of many chemical pollutants has not been characterized. So this is just to show you that there's, there's an awful lot of work still to be done in general um, to get better information and better evidence on the on the links between chemical pollutants um, and health. And here is another example. Uh, this is a particular impact assessment on the health effects of endocrine disruptors. Um, 
And in this estimate, uh, it was estimated that the cost uh, in the European Union is around 157 billion euros per year in terms of uh, health related uh, costs. And this relates to, um, to a selection of, of endocrine disruptors, including certain pesticides, plastics, um, or, or chemicals present in, in plastics, including phthalates and BPA, um, flame retardants. But I think the most important message is here on the right-hand side of this slide, which is that this is really just the tip of the iceberg. And they estimated that the data shown there are based on fewer than 5% of likely endocrine disruptors. And many endocrine disruptors Raptor related health conditions were not included in the study because key data are lacking. So there's a, again, the same message is that we're looking at the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, uh, associations between chemical pollutants and health for which we have well-established uh, associations. And then I want to move to early life. We're talking about raising a healthy generation today. Um, our focus in, 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 in our exposome work, but also in other work of, of, of my institute, my program is uh, on, on early life uh, for well-known reasons. Uh, early life contains vulnerable periods of rapid organ development, um, infants, fetus, childhood periods are all related to specific exposure risks. Many chronic diseases have at least part of their origin in these early life periods. And if we can intervene and prevent from these early uh, periods onwards, um, we may have more success with our interventions and it will be a particularly um, efficient way to intervene. So those are all reasons uh, to focus on early life and they were the main reasons for us to focus on early life when we um, started working on the exposome. So what do we know about environmental chemicals, environmental pollutants and child health? Um, this is from um, uh, a review that we published, well, it's five years ago now. Um, I haven't updated this, but uh, it's just pretty much the same picture as as what I've shown you in the in the in the um, in the previous slides, for some pollutants or for some groups of pollutants, there's good evidence for associations with certain uh, fetal or child health outcomes. For example, in the relationship between outdoor air pollution and fetal growth, um, or in a relation between heavy metals such as lead and mercury and neurodevelopment, neurotoxicity. But then we see that for other compounds, especially the ones that are of more emerging concern, there is the evidence is moderate, often insufficient, of, or there are actually hardly any studies at all. Um, and we also see that actually of the chemicals of newer concern, the ones I mentioned that are present in plastics and, and other consumer products, such as phthalates, bisphenol A. There's only a few actually included in this review because for many of the, of the newer chemicals, there, there just weren't uh, enough studies, at least not when we, we did this review. Obviously there's more and more evidence coming out, um, but the picture is there, which is that there's a, the evidence is, is scattered and um, not well established for many of of the newer chemicals. Um, and that is often not because there are, well, first of all, because there haven't been enough studies, also because uh, there are many uncertainties in, um, in exposure assessments, for example, and there's are inconsistencies in, in the existing studies. So that's a little bit the status of the evidence uh, in terms of child health and, and, and environmental pollutants. And I'm, I want to add to that the fact that all of the studies that were included in that review, for example, are based on single exposures. Um, and none of them, at least up to that time point, uh, took into account um, mixtures or, or multiple exposures. 
so now we move to the expo zone. Um, the expo zone was proposed in 2005 by Chris Wilde, the then director of, of IARC. Um, and he recognized that there was an enormous disparity in the tools, the knowledge and the investment that have has gone into um, genetics or uh, is characterizing the genome and um, environmental exposures. And that was for him the reason to, to propose uh, the word exposome, um, which he defined as, as representing all environmental exposures, including those from diet, lifestyle, endogenous sources from conception onwards as a quantity of critical interest to disease etiology. So really the, the idea behind was this was to, to draw attention to, to this need to redress the balance. A lot of investment has gone into, um, into genes and uh, we need more investment in, in, in environment, in the environmental part of uh, disease causation to fill all the gaps that are uh, clear from, from, um, from the existing evidence. And why is it important? Why can it help to give uh, an area, an ohm suffix? Well, it is, well, here I have a quote from a Nature article in 2013, which said that ideally branding an area as an ohm can help us to encourage um, big ideas, uh, define research questions, and inspire new analytical approaches to tackle these. So it's a way to, to um, encourage uh, new ideas and inspire uh, new approaches. Um, so then the question is, how do we do that for the exposome? Because it's such a complex uh, concept. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's far, far, far more complicated than measuring um, your genome. How do we measure an exposome which, which is uh, dynamic and, and, and it, it, you know, it, it, it is not well defined. So many people have tried to define the exposome um, taking more restrictive definitions or broader definitions. But I think for today, I think it's, it is more useful to look at it as a framework that can help us to move forward on some of the new research questions and, and important research question in questions in the environmental uh, exposure and health uh, studies and, and use this as a framework to encourage um, new data collections and new approaches um, in this field. So the first feature that, that is uh, important in, this, in, in the exposome concept is the holistic idea. And that would help us to, to encourage uh, studies that take the environment as a more complex system, looking at the different domains that make up uh, our environment and, and encouraging um, studies that tackle multiple exposures in one way or another, instead of looking at each exposure in, in, as a single entity. Secondly, the exposome has, has this life course uh, perspective, which uh, can help to encourage us to look more at the temporal sequence of exposure that lead to, to disease ultimately. Thirdly, um, the exposome is, well, it, it in, includes a lot of, um, well, it has a large emphasis on the development of new tools and technologies, especially tools and technologies to, to improve the coverage of the exposures that we measure. So to get a more complete measurement of our environmental exposures, but also the to improve the accuracy of exposures. So, so there's a lot of emphasis here on on getting better methods for exposure meth, uh, assessment and also more uh, methods that can measure more exposures. And this is a mix of more traditional exposure assessment tools and, and newer exposure assessment tools. I don't have, I, I can't go into each separately, but I think what is important to note here is that you cannot measure an exposome with one method and it has to ultimately come from a combination of, of, of different tools and technologies, including 
the newer methods such as the mobile devices and sensors, the omics technologies, and then also drawing on uh, well-established methods, um, GIS-based models, um, biomarker, biomonitoring methods, and questionnaires. Now, a fourth feature of the exposome is that it includes this internal domain. Um, and that um, can help us to, to look for, well, to better understand what happens internally. So to look at our internal environment and, and the early biological responses to the environmental exposures. And here the idea is that environmental exposures from different sources may act on similar or different um, uh, physiological responses uh, and that these can be measured through omics or other biomarkers. And that would help us to better establish um, the, the um, biological mechanisms behind associations between uh, environmental exposures and health. Um, this is a slide to, to further show you the different omics technologies that, that may be used um, to measure, uh, sorry, to measure our internal em environment and, and the omics responses going from the genomics, transcriptomics, uh, proteomics to the smaller molecules measured uh, through metabolomics. And now also including measurements of um, exogenous uh, chemicals, mole chemical molecules. Uh, so, so some of these methods are now being expanded to include um, exposome measures, so including exposure measurements. Um, and then as a last feature, um, because we're talking about uh, an ohm, so uh, the suffix ohm also stands for the untargeted part of this definition uh, of exposure. And this, this part may help us to, um, to go more towards detecting unknown exposures or what we call unknown, unknown exposures, but those would be exposures that we don't usually focus on in our research studies so that are not so um not not well established um and here there's a big place for the uh, advances in uh, high resolution mass spectrometry uh, coming from the metabolomics field as i said that is being developed to go further and further into the detection of also chemicals uh, exogenous chemical exposures um, and this is a fairly new development. There's still <laughs> plenty of uh, difficulties there in terms of uh, the sensitivity of these methods and the annotation of unknown, unknown chemicals. But this is certainly a very promising field to have um, characterization of many chemicals uh, in a blood sample, for example. Uh, it's still very early days for exposome research. If we see, we look at numbers of publications, maybe it's up to about 200 a year. Um, if we just look at the mention of exposome in PubMed, if you type in genome, you will find thousands and thousands of publications every year. Um, it's still the early days. We also know that the full measurement of an exposome, even at a single point of time, is not possible. But, um, and Chris Wilde already said this in 2012, as the work on characterizing the exposome evolves, it's important to, to, to remember this, to retain this notion that even a partial description can lead to major public health benefits. So we don't necessarily need to describe the whole exposome or measure absolutely everything because we know that will just not be possible. And I think it's more important in this to, to really focus on some of these features that I just presented that can help us to get better evidence uh, and more and look at the environment in a more uh, holistic way. So that leads me to Helix. Um, Helix is a project that was funded by the seventh framework program of the European Union. 
And this is a this was funded as a large collaborative research project. So it's a project that had um, 13 partners throughout Europe, um, people responsible for different parts of the project. Um, and we responded to a specific expert on call. And um, we wanted to provide a wide coverage of the exposome. And this project started in 2013, yeah, so it's some years ago. And we wanted to get as complete as possible uh, uh, exposure measurements um, for many different variables in our individual environment, in our more external environment, in the internal environment. And then we wanted to link that to child health uh, outcomes. And we did that by um, basing our study in six existing birth cohorts uh, spread throughout Europe. This is important because it was a European project and we had, uh, it was important to, to have the geographical spread. These are existing cohorts, so they've been running for, uh, for um, well, more than 10 years now. Um, and altogether, they had a population of about 30,000 mother-child pairs um, with a lot of existing data, as I said. So we decided to start by estimating um, exposures in the urban environment in this entire uh, study population using geospatial methods. And when I say urban environment, um, these are many variables that we can estimate uh, through GIS modeling, including meteorological variables, um, natural spaces, including green spaces, air pollutants, uh, built environment characteristics, and that includes um, walkability index, uh, population density, and some other um, uh, built environment variables. And then we had information on traffic um, and noise. So that, that is the urban environment that we estimated for 30,000 participants. And then we selected from that uh, cohort, uh, a sub cohort of 1300 mother and pa child pairs, where we did all the work on measuring biomarkers of chemical exposures, where we did uh, an omics, uh, we collected new blood and urine samples uh, to measure a range of omics uh, technologies. We, uh, we examined all these children at the age of between six and 11 years. So we had standard protocols in each of the six cohorts to do uh, health examinations. Uh, questionnaires were standardized. So this, is a, this was a very intense uh, cohort follow up. And we measured uh, exposure to a range of chemical um, chemicals, phthalates, phenols, etc., through through biomonitoring methods. And then we had information on lifestyle, smoking, etc., through questionnaires. And then, aside from that, we had some more, even more intensive panel studies where we focused on. Um, this was more for validation and to look at the variability in. Uh, the different exposures. Um, and these are some of the research questions that we wanted to answer in Helix. Um, we started by characterizing the early life exposome. So we thought it was important first to describe what, what this exposome or our exposome looked like in terms of its correlations, determinants and variability. So here we had questions such as how do the early life environmental exposures from this wide range of sources correlate in these different populations across Europe. So what are the, the specific profiles of exposure? Can we identify groups of the population that are exposed to multiple environmental hazards? And that is in, uh, an important question also um, for public health. And which factors actually determine multiple exposure patterns in your early life? Um, can we identify intervention targets, for example? And also for us, an important question was how variable are the measurements of these different exposures? So when you measure so many different things, we had in the end, we had about 100 different exposures measured during pregnancy and another 100 during childhood. So 
how variable are they and how different is the variability in the different exposures? And then we had questions surrounding the internal exposome. So that was to, to integrate our omics data. And the main question we wanted to answer there is, can we identify molecular, molecular sig signatures, omics signatures associated with the multiple exposures? And can these give us um, uh, information about uh, biological pathways or mechanisms? And then we wanted to link this exposome to the child health outcomes. So here, the main question we wanted to answer in Helix was, which are the early life exposures or exposure patterns that are most strongly associated with child health? And then we had an objective to develop also the statistical approaches and, and impact assessments uh, related to this. Um, I don't have uh, today, <laughs> I can't answer all of these questions, but I'll show you some examples of, of some of our results. Um, in terms of correlations, we started by really just describing all the correlations within this enormous data set of, of exposure variables. Um, as I said, there were about 100 uh, different exposure variables that we measured in the mothers and also in their children. And here's a, 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 this is a, a network visualization of these correlations. Uh, this is in the children. And the closer together these dots are, the, 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 more, the higher the correlations um, and the larger they are, the more connections they have to other exposures. So here we see that the main correlations are within groups of exposures. So here, for example, the diet variables cluster together and the outdoor uh, variables cluster together. But we also see that there are plenty of lines, correlations between different groups uh, of exposures. And this is important information for when we develop the statistical approaches to actually linking all that data to the health outcomes. And this is described in, in several, uh, several of our publications. Um, the next part of the project, as I said, was to look at variability in all these variables. Um, because, as I said earlier, the exposome is dynamic, it changes over time, and it's really, when you try to analyze all that data together, it's really important for the interpretation to know uh, about the variability. Um, and, and we did that through different methods. Um, where the children wore sensors to look, for example, at personal air pollution exposure that gave us information about the, uh, the temporal variation in, in those uh, exposure assessments. We took repeat urine samples in the panel studies to quantify the variability, in, especially in, in the more non-persistent chemicals, such as bisphenol A, bifthalates, um, and some of the pesticides. And then we also we did the same for the omics data. So we looked at the variability in the in the repeat uh, omics measurements, uh, and that gave us a lot of information on on um, on the variability uh, um, between uh, all the different omics methods. And then we tried. Then we also. Um, as I said before, it was important for us to look at the determinants of these exposures. And one of, obviously one important uh, determinant here is, is socioeconomic status. And we started here with the urban exposome. So our whole, uh, our whole list of exposure estimates related to the urban environment, including air pollution, green spaces, noise, and we looked at that for the nine different cities in our, um, in our study. And what we found was that, first of all, the urban exposome showed considerable variability across Europe. So these nine cities are all quite different in terms of their urban exposures. And we found that pregnant women of low socioeconomic position were exposed to higher levels of environmental hazards 
in some cities, but not in others. And this may not come as a surprise, but it, it does mean that in, in some cities, such as, for example, here in Bradford or in Valencia, people of lower socioeconomic class had um, higher exposures, whereas in others, such as Oslo or in um, Sabadell here near Barcelona, um, the opposite was true. And again, this gives us important information about who is exposed to multiple exposures. And it also helps us later to interpret the findings uh, of our um, association studies. Similarly, for the uh, chemical exposome, so this is the list of all the chemical biomarkers that we measured in our study. Again, we find that the patterns are not always as we expect, or at least here it means that um, chemical contamin contaminant exposure during fetal and childhood life was not exclusively associated with low socioeconomic position. So for some of these chemical groups, it's actually the mothers of higher socioeconomic class or the children of higher socioeconomic class that are more exposed. And especially that is especially the case for uh, persistent organic pollutants um, and for some of the metals like uh, mercury and arsenic. And this is to do with uh, behaviors, for example, the fish consumption. Um, and then we see for other uh, chemical pollutants, for example, here the phthalates, these were more related to the lower socioeconomic classes. And again, that has to do with the type of um, the type of products that are used uh, in the different uh, population groups. And this type of work will give us important information about who is exposed to which cocktails uh, of chemicals. The next part of the study, as I said, was the integration of the omics data. Uh, we had, we, we applied several um, omics platforms going from DNA methylation and transcriptomics to measuring proteins and, and metabolites. Some of these are more targeted uh, platforms that were the ones that were most uh, reliable and available um, when we started the study some years ago. And um, we use this to link all of the ex each of the exposures to each of the omic signals. Um, this is not published yet, this information, but it gives us information on, on, on many associations. And we use that to create a network to see um, which chemical exposures had imprints uh, in the different omics layers. And we see, for example, that the prenatal exposures predominantly um, had associations with the DNA methylation measured in the children. Whereas for the childhood exposures, we found omics uh, associations, imprints or signatures uh, across the different layers in the omics data. And this gave us ideas about uh, possible biological imprints, and also it, it may give us an idea of different sources of exposure. There are other things we can do with the omics data. Um, I can't go into each in detail today, but we've, we're also working on looking at specific exposures and looking at the multi-layer signatures in the omics data. This is an example of a paper on smoking, which uh, where we went into detail on the different um, omics signatures related to uh, in utero and childhood uh, tobacco smoke exposure. And we find indeed that certain um, omics uh, signatures, for example, the DNA methylation are related to maternal smoking, but that for childhood, there were certain metabolites and proteins um, that um, that were associated and which gives us ideas about potential early biological effects. And similarly, uh, we've, we have um, used the omics data to make, uh, to give a better biological interpretation, for example, in the association between um, exposure to perfluorinated compounds and uh, and liver enzymes, where we found that this was 
possibly mediated through alterations in key um, amino acids uh, and, and phospholipid pathways. So this is a way to use the omics data to get better information on possible biological uh, pathways. A few conclusions regarding that. Um, first of all, early life is important. Exposures may actually have effects at the molecular level that cannot yet be measured um, in these children, but these, these, that these remain clinically undetectable until adulthood. So, so the childhood years are a good um, time point uh, to look for early, um, early molecular effects. Um, the molecular signatures that we found might be, uh, they may represent markers of exposure or exposure sources, or they may identify early signs or responses uh, to, dam um, to environmental agents. So the omics tools are a promising tool. Uh, the omics technologies are promising tools, um, but they require a replication. And I think that's an important message here. Uh, all these first signals need to be replicated in larger populations, in prospective follow-ups, and, and with repeated time points of measurement. And then my last uh, part of the study was related to, to linking the multiple exposures um, to child health outcomes. So in the six cohort studies that we included, we did health outcome assessments, um, examining the children, uh, measuring lung function, blood pressure, uh, doing uh, neurodevelopmental tests, uh, behavioral questionnaires. And then we linked each of our exposures to these different health outcomes. And this, has been, this work has been published in a series of papers where we took a sort of exposome, what, what we call an exposome-wide approach or an expos approach, which is linking each exposure to each uh, to the to the outcome and testing um, for mul uh, sorry uh, 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 correcting for multiple testing in these analyses. And this is an example of the type of results uh, we get. This is linking multiple exposures to to BMI, um, and and we find a range of results uh, with. Um, some positive, some negative associations, um, and some of them actually are below the threshold uh, p-value for multiple testing. <laughs> and um, yeah, so so here we get some indications of which of our many exposures may be associated to the child health outcomes. And then. As a second step, after doing the exposome-wide analysis, we also build um, models using a, a variable selection approach, which is a statistical method that uh, goes through all the variables, taking account of the correlation, and selects the set of variables that best predict um, the health outcome. And doing that, for each of our different outcomes, we actually get a picture of which of the exposure variables in our data set were related to the different health outcomes in the children. And here we're starting to get an interesting picture of some exposures that are associated with several or, or yeah, several or more than one of the health outcomes in our study. And then there were other exposures that were associated to only one outcome. So they were much more specific to a specific um, health endpoint in the children. Yeah, so uh, some of them are not at all a surprise. So tobacco smoke, this is maternal. This is, these are exposures during the pregnancy. So maternal tobacco smoke is related to, uh, I think at least three of the health outcomes that we measured in this case, blood pressure, child behavior and obesity. But some of the chemical exposures, for example, bisphenol A, was only associated to blood pressure, but not to the other um, health outcomes. So by systematically associating each of the exposures with different outcomes, we get uh, a much more systematic picture of all these different associations. 
And this is the same for the exposures during childhood. Here we see, for example, indoor air coming back for different health outcomes, um, built environment variables, indoor and outdoor air pollutants. Um, so this gives us important information on which exposures may be important to focus on in, in, in more specific studies. So here are some of the advantages of, of analyzing data in this way compared to a more traditional approach. So in a more traditional study, one would publish each of the exposures or each exposure group in a separate paper. And, and we decided not to do that. We decided to publish them together in one paper and to take this systematic and comprehensive approach. Um, and there's some advantages of doing that. Um, it corrects for multiple testing. Whereas if you publish papers separately for each exposure, you would not do that, even though in a way the analysis would be the same. You avoid publication bias by publishing all the associations. So every association between an exposure and an outcome is actually published in these papers. Uh, it corrects for confounding by co-exposures. So in the, in the variable selection methods that we use, we build uh, multiple exposure models that, that account for this type of confounding. Um, and it's a type of suspect screen. No, it's, a, it's a, a, an analysis where you, where you put in everything. It's, it's exploratory. It may be useful to detect novel risk factors. For example, we found associations with uh, the copper concentration in blood that was measured as a biomarker. There's very little literature on this, but it might give us um, some ideas uh, for future research. And ultimately, we would hope that this type of approach is useful for priority setting because it would give us the information needed to intervene on agents that are most likely to be associated with health by giving this, this very systematic um, analysis. There's quite a lot of limitations and obviously there's a lot of challenges also related to this type of approach. Um, I realize that we're close to the end of this, of the time slots. Um, I will go through it very quickly. Uh, importantly, it's still difficult to rank exposures um, or to order them by their importance because uh, we measure each exposure with a different measurement error. So the actual direct comparison is still different, difficult. Um, there may be false positives due to the high correlations in the data. Part of our study was cross-sectional because the childhood part was measured at the same, uh, we measured exposures at the same time as the outcomes. So we have some possible problems with reverse causality. Power and sample size are a problem when you when you want to look at many exposures at the same time. We did not in yet look at interactions between all these exposures. This is something for a next stage. Also, uh, in these um, analysis that I showed you, we did not try to combine exposures together or to look at them as a group together. Um, so we didn't test for mixture effects. Again, that is something for a next stage. And then there are many, many questions about the further complexities in the data in terms of the causal structures and hierarchies in the data, um, which again is something that, that will need to be uh, done in, 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 in follow-up studies. And, and we did not uh, try to look at the unknown exposures. We, we've limited ourselves to this group of suspect uh, exposures rather than going beyond that to the to the unknown exposures. I am happy to say that we're following up on this work. So many of the uh, challenges and limitations that we encountered in, in the first work um, are coming. We, we have the opportunity to work on this more in the athlete project, um, which will, will give us a follow-up point to the helix. So we will follow up the same cohort of children and we will also build a platform of, uh, for um, replication by including a larger network of cohorts across Europe. 
We also, in Athlete, focus on some interventions to try and um, improve um, personal and, out and urban exposomes in, in pregnant women and children. And we're focusing in athlete also more on the translational aspects. So how can, how can we make sure that these exposome results will become um, useful for, um, for policy and regulation? And, and, and there's quite a lot more work to be done on that. Um, for those of you who are interested more on the methodological side, we have a, a, an exposome data challenge event, which may be uh, of interest, where we will go much more into the uh, complex uh, and advanced uh, statistical methods for um, analysis of, of multiple exposures and of the integration of multi, multi omics uh, data sets. So that's just to say for whoever is interested, uh, please check our website on the data challenge event. And then I want to acknowledge uh, the many collaborators in this project. Um, this is uh, certainly not a study that can be done by a, a small group of people. And we, we had many different teams across Europe uh, involved in this study. And I would like to stop here and thank you very much thank you so much dr i had for such an insightful uh, lecture really learned a lot from this uh, uh, lecture uh, so our time is running short i will have just one quick uh, question if you can just quickly and then we'll move on next speaker then afterwards we have a panel discussion and we can allow audience to ask more questions um so um Dr. Barnaby was asking how and where does the psychosocial stress fit into the helix model of the exposome, particularly in, in regards to the perinatal outcome? Yes, so we, um, sorry, this, this project was focused mainly on environmental pollutants. So it wasn't one of our main objectives to measure psychosocial stress, but we do, of course, in the cohort, we have collected um, social uh, position variables, and that's mainly variables such as education, um, neighborhood deprivation, occupation. Those are the variables that exist in the prenatal period. And that we had to use uh, the data that already existed during the pregnancy because these are existing cohorts. Now in the follow-up of the children, we have specific questionnaires on psychosocial stress. So we're trying to get better information on that. And indeed it can be integrated as another exposure, as another risk factor. So this is one of the things we want to do is to expand a bit our exposome to include more um, stress variables and more uh, lifestyle and, and health behavior related uh, variables as well. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, and we'll have more questions when we do the panel discussion. Thank you. Should I answer some questions in the chat or, or, or not? Uh, can we do that together in the panel discussion? Right. Okay, thank you so much. All right, uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Um, uh, Polly Mandola, who is the currently the professor and the chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health at UB. And she joined us last year in the fall from her um, position as a senior investigator from uh, epidemiology branch in NICHD. And previously she also served as the chief of the infant child Women's House Statistic Branch at National Center for House Statistics and Chief of the Epidemiology and Biomarker Branch of the National House and Environmental in fact, Research Laboratory of US EPA. And she, today her talk uh, is about long-term consequences of, of uh, obstetric and neonatal risk associated with air pollution. Pauline? Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you to uh, Dr. Mu for the invitation to come and, and speak to you all today. 
I'm going to share my screen. If that's coming through. So I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this. You know, we're especially following that um, very informative keynote on the exposome. And I'm going to talk about some specific obstetric and neonatal risks that are associated with air pollution and how those impact long-term health for the offspring. And I think this is really important when we think about raising a healthy generation to think again about these early time points that we have opportunities for prevention, that things like preconception health and pregnancy health and infancy health really have an impact on later adult health outcomes. Page down, not working. Okay, slides won't advance. Let me try something else. Let's try this one. There we go. Um, so I'll give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about, which is how early life events actually can influence adult health and some uh, background on air pollution exposures and the neonatal and obstetric outcomes that I'll talk about so that you have the definitions. And I'm going to take this opportunity to also talk about the interaction with maternal asthma which also um, sometimes independently and sometimes interacts with air pollution to be associated with these risks. When we think about the long-term consequences for offspring adult health, I'll talk a bit about cardiac and renal disease, but spend a little bit more time on lung function, which is something I have a little bit more um, experience with. And then finally end up with a summary of some of these exposure risk scenarios, some of the issues that are important to think about as well as those long-term effects. So this work is really grounded in the theory of developmental origins of health and disease. So you sometimes hear that called DOHAD, um, also fetal programming. So we've been thinking about this for the last 40 years or so, you know, what are those in utero or early life influences that can have long-term health effects? And the focus really has been on the role of prenatal and perinatal exposure to environmental factors like maternal stress, a lot of work on nutrition, over and under nutrition, and toxic exposures, particularly things like air pollution, in the development of adult disease. A lot of the focus here has been on epigenetic changes and altered metabolism that really influence these risks across generations. And I'll take the point here to say that what I'm gonna talk about today is mostly maternal exposure and the influence on fetal development and health. But we also have some evidence certainly for paternal exposures having an influence on epigenetic changes in particular. So I'm not talking about that today, but it doesn't mean that it's not important. We know that air pollution is associated with a variety of adver adverse obstetric and neonatal outcomes. And this literature is really built over the last 30 years. Today, I'm gonna to talk about preterm birth and neonatal respiratory complications. And I'm also gonna talk about the influence of maternal asthma. Maternal asthma is now the most chronic, chronic it's most common chronic disease in pregnancy. About 10% of the current obstetric population in the United States are women with asthma. So it's a, it's a large proportion of, um, of current pregnancies. So why think about asthma when we think about air pollution? In the literature, we see that both air pollution and asthma appear to independently increase these obstetric and neonatal risks. But if we step back, air pollution is associated with the development of asthma and also the exacerbation of asthma. But up until uh, really our work and still now, there's very little data on the potential joint effects um, of asthma and air pollution or 
any information on whether asthmatic women are particularly susceptible to the effects of air pollution. So when we talk about air pollution, it's good to just have a general sense about, you know, what are we talking about? This is a, a complex mixture of a lot of things. You'll hear a lot about particles, particulate matter, and, and so we shorthand that as PM. And PM10 are particles 10 microns and less in size. PM2.5 particles two and a half microns less in size. All particles five microns or smaller will pass through the lung into circulation. So that's important to think about. You know, not only do you get local irritant effects in the lung, but you can also see particles pass into the bloodstream. So size matters, how far down in the lung the particles get, but also what's on the particle. Most particles have a carbonaceous center, but there are other things at, you know, adhered or stuck on the particle, things like viruses, other biologics, pollens, um, all sorts of chemicals and compounds can be stuck to the particles. Those will dissolve in the lung and go into the bloodstream. We also have gases, lots of which induce oxidative stress. And we'll talk today about nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and ozone, ozone is a particularly potent oxidizer, so that's important to think about. Also in air, there are other toxic substances. Some of them are volatile in air, pesticides, solvents, even some metals. Those are also things that can adhere to particles. So when we think about preterm birth. Preterm birth is defined as less than 37 completed weeks of gestation. About 10% of babies in the United States every year are born preterm, somewhere between 380 and 400,000 children every year. So that is not a small amount of the population. Preterm birth can be spontaneous. Um, so these are things that occur without any intervention, things like a premature rupture of membranes or early onset of labor, or it can be medically indicated which is when there's a situation where the health of the baby or the mother necessitates an early induction of birth. I'm also gonna talk about some of these adverse respiratory outcomes in neonates. Some are more common than others. Uh, transient tachypnea of the newborn is a very fast or labored breathing due to fluid in the lungs. It typically resolves quickly and it's thought to have no long-term consequences, but as you'll see as we go through the talk, anything that impairs lung function in infants is suggested to have a long-term effect. Asphyxia is another complication, and this is characterized by oxygen deprivation, and it can be mechanical or through weak or absent breathing. The consequences of asphyxia are generally dependent on the degree of oxygen deprivation. And the most common of these adverse outcomes is respiratory distress syndrome or RDS. And this is difficulty breathing typically due to a lack of surfactant or underdeveloped lungs. And this is well known to be associated with long-term breathing problems. So if we start out just thinking about asthma, newborns of mothers with asthma have a lot of increased risk for restricted growth. They're more likely to go the neonatal intensive care unit, they're more likely to have neonatal jaundice. They also have increased risk for all the respiratory complications that we've mentioned. And when we look at their preterm birth risk, we can see that that risk generally is elevated after 34 weeks of gestation up into 37 weeks. So they tend to be associated with late preterm deliveries. So thinking about maternal asthma, what we're seeing is that asthma alone increases risk. So mom has asthma, the increased risk for a preterm birth is about 17% overall. And almost all of that is medically indicated. So those are risks near the end of the preterm period where the health of the mother or the health of the baby is otherwise, is otherwise compromised. In terms of respiratory complications, 
For both TTN and RDS, we see about a 10% increase in risk, nearly associated with maternal asthma. And asphyxia, we see as high as 34% increased risk. So let's look at that in relation to air pollution exposure. And when we look here at these exposure windows, I'm gonna talk about carbon monoxide here and nitrogen oxides very early in the preconception period. And again, very early in pregnancy. And what we see is that when moms have asthma, there's a significantly increased risk for preterm birth where in the non-asthmatics for carbon monoxide, there's actually not a risk associated with carbon monoxide. And for NOx, in the same early time windows, we can see that while there is an increased risk for women without asthma, between three and 8% for preterm birth, that risk is tripled essentially for women who have asthma. So we see these significant interactions at these early time windows. And also of interest, the last six weeks of pregnancy, almost every one of the criteria air pollutants is associated with a significantly higher risk of preterm birth when mom has asthma compared to when she doesn't. So we see these increased risks associated with air pollution compounded by maternal asthma. When we look at air pollution and the increased risk for these respiratory complications for transient tachypnea, we're seeing risks for particles and carbon monoxide in sort of the 10 to 15% range, both early in pregnancy and chronic pregnancy exposure. Asphyxia, again, we see really substantial risks associated with ozone about a 70% increase that is persistent across pregnancy. We see for PM 2.5 from about a 50% increase to an 80% increased risk in asphyxia associated with chronic exposure and a bit of an increased risk as well associated with carbon monoxide. And for respiratory distress syndrome, here we see nitrogen oxides and ozone associated with between a 40 and 20% increased risk. So this says air pollution exposure, this is ambient air during the prenatal period is associated with poor breathing in the newborn. Interestingly here, we saw no interaction with maternal asthma. So you've got an asthma effect of a 10% increase in TTN and RDS, 30% increase in asphyxia. And then on top of it, we see an increased risk associated with air pollution. So just to kind of briefly go over some of the long-term consequences, when we're thinking about preterm birth, and it's well known that preterm birth is associated with neurologic and developmental delays. So there are a lot of those kind of complications that can have long-term lifelong consequences for offspring. Less well known and less appreciated are that the impaired or arrested structural and functional development of key organ systems. You don't have enough chance to develop the organ system fully and that has implications for adult health. And I'll mention a few of those with respect to cardiovascular and renal risks. So we definitely see increased blood pressure in adults who are born preterm. That is very well established. Also changes in heart structure and function, particularly things like ventricular hypertrophy and increased risk of heart failure, chronic kidney disease and end stage renal disease is higher in adults who are born preterm. And it's an interesting presentation because they tend to have smaller kidneys but preserved glomerular filtration rates so the thought is that they have fewer nephrons and then the blood pressure is higher to sort of keep that GFR stable. So it's sort of pushing through more blood into a smaller kidney. When we think about chronic lung disease, these early life morbidities are really um, driving lung function and that's influenced at some level by maternal asthma, certainly by her disease severity, but also potential underlying immune dysfunction. 
we see a preterm birth effect on lung disease that's independent of respiratory morbidity. And we also have a respiratory distress and bronchopulmonary dysplasia effect. Often infants with RDS will be, um, have oxygen therapy, mechanical ventilation, which can cause lung damage. And we see an air pollution effect. Just to give sort of a brief overview so people can um, see what, how lung function develops over the life course. You see age along the x-axis here and you see forced expiratory volume in one second. It's how much you can breathe out in one second for males and females. And this is a general um, overview. One thing you'll notice is males have bigger lungs. So they have seven liters. Females have smaller lungs at five liters. Often I'll talk about present a percent predicted FEV, right? So that's how much should you be able to breathe out from 100% down to, right, whatever level. And those are a function of gender and height, because those are the two things that will predict the size of your lungs. And you can see from birth until about age 20, as lung volume increases, you have higher uh, amounts of uh, forced expiratory volume, and then it goes down later in life. So you can see impaired lung function at any age. What we really love to see is this green line here at 100% normal lung function, that's great. But what can happen to that? You can have people who start out with normal lung function and then decline over time in this blue line. Maybe they smoke, maybe they have an occupational exposure, so their lung function declines. Someone who has severe asthma as a child may see their lung function decline by as early as age six and then never recover. What we're most interested in here are these early origins of airflow limitation. So that purple line um, is the place where we're most interested. And just as a, as a good example of how that plays out, this is a figure from the Melbourne Asthma Study and it's the predicted forced expiratory volume um, from age 10, and they track the same people up to age 50. And what I wanna draw your attention to here is this dark red line, which is people who eventually developed chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And even at age 10, their lung function was lower, closer to 80% of their predicted value than other people in the cohort, including people who had normal lung function. Another way of thinking about this and another um, study that is very interesting is looking at lung capacity shortly after birth. So when you look at that, what you see is that the lowest quartile of lung function at birth also predicts low lung function in adulthood age 26 to 32. And that tracks in a really dose response manner over the course of, of that time frame from birth. So right at birth, we can see already something that says, here's what this adult lung function is gonna look like. So just to do a quick summary of some of these scenarios, um, it's important to remember that air pollution is a time varying exposure. Um, Any time you measure it, it's a snapshot in time and it's, it's long-term. It's a complex mi mixture. The measurements we have are often for regulatory purposes or based on models. We don't often have good assessment of that. And I think in terms, when we talked about the exposome, it, it's the same sort of problem in that we have a lot of things going on that it's hard to capture what that full experience is like over the life course. Many of the sources for air pollution are correlated, so it can be hard to separate those effects. And nobody's unexposed. There are no unexposed individuals, no unexposed timeframes. So it's all a question of um, how high, how much, and when. We assume linear relationships for a lot of these things. They may not be. So we do try to pay attention to regulatory cut points, but also extremes need to measure both acute and chronic effects. And it's clear that these in utero and really early life conditions contribute to adult disease risk. So this is a case where if we're interested in raising healthy generations, 
thinking about intergenerational health. You wanna think about the opportunities in preconception health and in pregnancy health to prevent some of these conditions that will occur in later life as a result of these early um, exposures and, and outcomes. So I tried to try to catch us up a little bit on time, but certainly feel free to email me um, if you wanna follow up at all. And if there's time for questions, I'm happy to take some. Thank you so much, Pauline, for such a fascinating uh, uh, speech. Uh, it's really always amazed to find out how the early life, you know, preconception exposure to the air pollution can affect the birth outcome. Um, it's really amazing. Uh, our little bit we are a little bit behind. I'll move on to the next speaker. And if you have a question to Pauline, please put in the chat box or just let me know you have a question. I'll call you uh, in the panel discussion. All right, thank you, Pauline, again. So our next speaker is Dr. Um, Shaoling, who is currently the professor uh, of both Department of Environmental Health Science and Department of Epidemiology Biostatistics School of Public Health at University at Albany, and she's also the Associate Director of Global Health Research and Research Director of Bureau Environmental and Occupational Epidemiology uh, in the Center of Environmental Health uh, uh, in New York State uh, Department of Health. And she has 30 years of research experience in directing various environmental uh, health study, successfully completed 50 studies since 1990. It's really amazing. Dr. Shaw has been involved in multiple national climate change commission in developing climate change uh, indicator, evaluate current uh, heat stress definitions and preparing white papers regarding climate change to the US Congress. Uh, her talk today will be climate change, extreme weather and natural disaster on human health. Welcome Dr. Lee. Yes, good morning. Do you see my slide? Nope. Nope. I don't want to put it Sorry. Is that so up? Nope. Doesn't look like it's shared. Are you able to click the share screen? Yeah, I couldn't get that too. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So you got it now, right? Yeah. Okay, good, yeah, okay. Let me just get the yeah for that. So good morning, everyone. Yeah. So I'm I'm so glad to be here to share um, my research um, regarding climate change, extreme weather, and also natural disaster on human health. So I would like to start a slide to describe the the, the evidence for climate change. So as you can see from this slide, this is in 1951 to 1980 for the the normal distribution for the temperature in the global. So 50 years later in 2001 to 2011, you can see that the bell shape uh, distribution shift to right. So the extreme temperature events used to cover 0.1% of the earth. Now they cover 10%. It's about, you can see that the dark red in the right hand side. So it's totally moved to the right for about 100% increase. So there are two uh, facts I want to highlight here for climate change. The one is like climate change not only change the average global temperature and also more importantly, change the, the variance of extreme temperatures in our world. Another fact is like the impact of climate change is very significant by region which means some places are warmer much faster than others. So when we conduct uh, climate related research, we should be pay attention to the geographic variations. So the threshold should be different by different region. 
Yeah, another thing uh, happened recently, so you probably noticed is like we call the climate change cause the disaster within a disaster. So based on the news yesterday, there were 30 hurricanes last year. So um, I think they predict there were 18 hurricanes this year. So also we have more like wildfires and in California, flooding throughout the whole country and also other disasters like the thunderstorm and other storms. So since 2009, um, I have been funded for nine uh, federal grants uh, by CDC, NIH, NYSODA. So we basically look at like the extreme weather, climate change on the different health outcomes. We target on some understudy health outcome like Lyme disease, birth outcomes, we also uh, got multiple grants that look at like the, the in health impacts of Hurricane Sandy and power outage effects. So what we talk about today. So the first study we published in, in epidemiology is the study we look at the high temperature uh, and humidity on respiratory disease and cardiovascular admission in New York City. So for this slide, I want to highlight two things. So we have a two health outcome uh, two outcomes here, like respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and we use, we use two indicate for temperature. One's temperature, air temperature, another one's apparent temperature. So as you can see here, we found the respiratory disease threshold effect is lower, right? Lower than the cardiovascular disease. So it's 89 for apparent temperature compared to 96. We also found the respiratory disease uh, have an immediate impact after the, the heat wave. So occur in the same day of the heat wave. However, for cardiovascular disease, it's about three days after um, the heat exposure. <clears throat> so this slide, uh, we try to show you the potential interaction between the temperature and humidities. So very interesting, um, when the temperature is lower than 86 degrees, so there's no much um, going on for the interaction. However, when the temperature is 88 degrees, or even like the 92 degrees. So we found that uh, uh, this square and the circle is separate. So we found a strong interaction or joy effect between the temperature and humidity on both diseases. Furthermore, we look at the, how the effect different by the SCS group. So we found um, the association increase as the age increase. So all out, uh, older adults tend to be have high risk susceptible to heat. We also found lower income family and also um, people with Hispanic, people are Hispanic is higher risk than the other groups. So now I shift the gear to talk about a birth defect and extreme temperature. So we published these papers in environmental health perspective. So as you can see from this slides, um, we found quite consistent association between extreme heat exposure and congenital cataract is one of the eye birth defect. So we found no matter which uh, indicator we use, we use yes, no for heat wave, frequency of, um, of heat exposure and duration of heat exposure, we found consistent uh, increase risk for congenital cataract. So then we're wondering whether or not this association could be just by chance, right? So we further look at the biological critical window for congenital cataract development, which was in gestational six and seven. These two weeks is the, the week for um, congenital cataract development. We found the effects only also show up in the same two weeks, right? It doesn't look like show up in other weeks. So this is further support our evidence. Um, the finding we found the association between extreme heat and congenital cataract. For birth defect, we also um, work with the colleague from the different state uh, in the country. So we use the national birth defect prevention study data to look at maternal MBU heat exposure during early uh, pregnancy in summer and spring and congenital heart defects. So this is a um, population-based case control study um, collect data from the eight states in the United States so as you can see here, the first three columns is for a uh, summer and the last three columns is for the spring time. So because a congenital heart defect can be quite, have different etiology for the different subtypes, we also look at the subtypes. So we found most of the significant association 
the increased risk is so up in the springtime only. So this is the figure we try to show you uh, for one um, specific, the most common uh, C, uh, CHD is uh, VSD. So we compare the Northeast, which is New York, our state, and also South, uh, Arizona, and also Texas. So we found uh, very interesting, the association only show up in these two states. So this is two uh, opposite, total different states, the coldest state and also the, the hardest state, right? So we found uh, no matter which indicator we use, like 90% high as a threshold or 95% high as a heat threshold, we found quite consistent uh, increased risk in the springtime, in the transitional month for VSD. Based on our finding, uh, we further project the increase um, for uh, the congenital heart defects in the whole country. So as you can see, the color representative the, the risk. So we found the highest projection for the future 50 years in United States uh, increase um, congenital heart defect due to heat wave is in with Midwest, right? Followed by uh, New York, Northeast, and also South, uh, Texas, Arizona, and then Utah for that. So this paper has been, um, has, has caught a lot of uh, media attention. So we have uh, about 30 million um, by the media uh, impressed uh, for, for this paper. So we just talk about the, the heat effect. Now we um, change the angle to talk about the cold spells effect on cardiovascular hospital admission. Uh, in both winter and transitional month. So as you can see from this slide, the top one, top up uh, part is the wheel, um, wind chill temperature, right? So the bottom one is that air temperature alone. So we found um, when the people exposed to wind chill temperature, four days later, like four, five, six days, especially in six days after the cold exposure, the cardiovascular disease admission significantly increased for all the, the, like the temperature range, for the cold temperature range. However, we didn't find anything uh, for the air temperature alone, right? Because we see all the green color is even have a protective effect for use temperature alone. So this is for winter season. So this slide show you um, the same two uh, indicator, but this is like the transitional month, it's November before winter. So it's, the pattern is quite different here, right? So we found, um, although we also found the increased risk for, um, for cold spells after five days, like four and five days, we also found some increased risk by use the temperature alone. Okay. So we conclude um, based on our findings, early warning during transitional month and providing educational advice after cold spell may be very important because currently, uh, most uh, forecasts, we only focus on winter season, but most people ignore the transitional month because that's the time most people, um, they don't pay attention to the cold, cold effects that uh, they don't wear, they don't turn on the heating and they don't wear like uh, any protective like clothing and hat. So this is probably the season for public health should be pay attention to transitional month. So another message um, we uh, want to bring uh, to is like, we found that many countries currently still use temperature alone in winter as a, as a weather advisory a warning indicator, which is not sensitive based on our finding. So we found the wind chill temperature is a sensitive indicator for CVD predictor during winter, but temperature alone may be a good uh, or proper indicator for transitional month. Yeah. Another um, important like the implication for this study is that like, since 2000, both the US and Canada, we use the uh, North American wind chill index. So however, the, the threshold or the standard is, is quite low. It's like minus five to minus 19 or minus 10 to minus uh, 24. However, based on our finding, we found the temperature uh, even lower than 10 Fahrenheit. So the CVD already increased risk. So which tell us uh, the current standard is probably too low, right? So uh, the, like the 10 degree Fahrenheit already begin to cause health impact. So another study I want to introduce is pretty, um, I think it's pretty interesting studies. We look at like the um, Northeast spread out in 2003. 
So this is the largest breakout in the U.S. history, lasts for 31 hours, uh, which is widespread, affect 50 million people. And New York City especially hit the, um, I think it's hit the hardest, uh, especially during the um, rush hour. So you can see this is the Times Square during the Northeast breakout. So we found that uh, very interesting, just immediately right after the bread out. So you see, this is the vertical line for bread out. So we found a huge spike for this um, respiratory disease uh, hospitalization, right? A significant increase. We also found the same pattern for total mortality for the in New York City. So because there is a heat wave also during this bread out, so we use uh, two control groups, as you can see in the last two columns. One is we try to see whether or not is the heat waves effect alone, right? And, and this column, we try to show whether or not this is the black hour versus the normal, which means the joy effect between the black hour and heat wave. So we found, um, you see the bold um, columns, I right, highlight. So this is the, uh, uh, the result we found that is like, it looks like it's the joy effect between the black hour and also the heat wave. So however, we found very interesting, it's like different from what we just described, we found white people, uh, non-Hispanic and high income people have a higher risk than other groups after the bread hours. So why? So you were wondering why, why the high SES group have a higher risk during the bread hour. So our explanation is probably due to the air conditioner's effect because the high S is get used to use the air conditioner during the heat wave. So when uh, suddenly without the electricity, so they were more vulnerable to the heat wave's uh, effect. So that also tell us we cannot uh, automatically assume low SES group always have high vulnerability for every disaster. So this totally depends on different disaster. We also conduct some study, look at the mental health effect um, after some natural disaster, especially after the Hurricane Sandy. I got three grants um, to look at um, these subjects. So as you can see, we use two control group um, in the Sandy studies. So one is the pre post after Sandy. Another one is we compare the affected and non-affected area uh, for the Sandy affected area. So no matter which control group we use, we did find significant increase immediately after Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, you can see the first column, right, for the, the increased risk. Another thing we interesting is we found the effect for mental health also is last, like four months and even one year after um, Hurricane Sandy. So we still found for, for cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease and injury and mental health too. So we found all these for this is a significant increase and also last time. So based on those findings, we also create the community vulnerability index. So this index is trying to overcome some of the limitation, uh, the current CDC social vulnerability index, because we can, we contribute, uh, we count the contribution for each of the, the variables. We also can know the direction significant positive or negative. And this is index is uh, disaster and disease specific. Yeah. So we use the machine learning methods, uh, the big data science method to come out this index and come out the map to try to support the, the New York State Department Health for potential intervention. So another, uh, the final project I want to bring here is like uh, we recently published in environmental research for a winter storm. So because I know uh, Buffalo is a um, city, I think it's affect or attacked by a lot of uh, winter ice storm or a snowstorm. So probably you are not aware in our state. So the top uh, cause for the disaster is a uh, winter storm is 40.7%, right? You can see. So followed by hurricane and also windstorm. So this slide try to show you um, the effects for the winter storm combined with the power outage winter storm alone, and also power outage alone. So for the last two columns, we found that there's no significant increased risk for power, power outage alone. But we do find uh, winter storm alone have a significant impact for multiple health outcomes for CVDs, lower respiratory disease, respiratory infection, injury, and also the waterborne and foodborne disease I didn't put here. 
Uh, but we found that the joy effect between the wind storm and power outage have a higher effect. Yeah, for all this disease. This is a ED visit, yeah. So um, we we do because we're doing the disaster research. We um, we have we got a lot of uh, we got a lot of attention by the media. So we got interviewed by uh, New York Times magazines and U.S. Conversation. So we we happy our finding can be translation to uh, translate to the public health practice by working for health department. Okay, I think that's all the slide I have today. Um, Thanks so much and um, thanks for your invitation. So I'm um, to having me to, to share my research finding. Thank you so much, Dr. Ling. Uh, right now, Jen, can you bring back all our um, uh, speakers for the first panel? Then we can start our panel discussion. All right. Uh, so we're a little bit behind. I'll just to start, I'll call the people who had a question. Joe, do you want to ask your question, Dr. Friedenheim? Um, I was wondering in um, the first uh, discussion about um, socioeconomic position in relation um, to uh, some of the effects, and I wondered how much um, you could take other factors into account in those analysis. For example, there might be differences in others at the time of pregnancy. So could there be some differences in exposure and the amount of exposure to based on the women who've been older so who like had a greater cumulative exposure? Joe had a hard time to hear you clearly. Uh, hello? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah um, that's clear. Um, so I'm asking about the comparisons by socioeconomic position, whether other factors like the age of the mothers at the time of pregnancy could be taken into account, that there, you might see differences in exposure because uh, women of higher, who are having pregnancies of higher socioeconomic position might be older. Okay, yeah, that was a question for me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we took those factors into account. Um, we adjusted, the results I showed were adjusted, I'm just checking, they were adjusted for uh, maternal age, um, parity, previous breast free, and previous breastfeeding and the child models were uh, adjusted also for breastfeeding of the child and the child age. And then we also ran some sensitivity analysis to, to add some extra uh, adjustment variables, um, for example, smoking and, and fish consumption. And they did not, uh, those extra variables did not uh, change the associations I showed, but um, it means that the associations I showed with socioeconomic status already take into account uh, age, for example. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yep, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Jason? Hi, Dr. Rehead. Uh, I have a question. I uh, was asking, how did you consider the timing of exposure when you were selecting the variables from the exome uh, that may be measured at different time because I was thinking um, for different exposure and outcome pairs the uh, biological relevant exposure window may be unique, but how did you consider that? Yeah, I mean, that's an important question. And um, in this study, we focused on two time periods. Uh, one was the pregnancy period, and then the other one was the childhood period uh, when the kids were six to 11 years old. Uh, that was partly because that's when we uh, implemented the new follow-up visits of those children. So that's where we had a collection point uh, for the data and the biosamples. And, and the same for the pregnancy. We had to use what was available in terms of biosamples. Um, so for the biomonitoring uh, variables, at least. So we don't always have much 
in the existing cohorts we don't we have to nest it within the cohorts so we have to rely on the, the data collections that are available um but those were our two main time periods uh, of focus. Um, for the modeled variables, for example, the, the, the variables that are estimated from um, geospatial modeling, we actually modeled um, the, the, the variables, the, the exposures for, for um, the pregnancy periods, for specific trimesters in, period, in, in pregnancy, and also for each year during the childhood. So we. The problem there is that they're very correlated. So it's always, it is hard to disentangle those different uh, periods. Um, so instead of sort of saying a priori, this is the period on which we focus, we, we actually looked for each, for all those exposures, we took the pregnancy as one period and the childhood uh, exposure as the other period. Um, because there aren't, I mean, for most exposures, it's not all that clear yet where we expect to find uh, associations. So in these in these uh, exposome analyses, which, as I said before, they're more uh, screening analyses or exploratory analyses, we look at um, all the available information without making an a priori selection of, of specific time periods. But I do recognize that it, there are complicated, uh, you know, it is complex um, and, and, and there are, it is not always easy to disentangle uh, those different time periods uh, because of the, the strong correlations also between um, exposures in different time periods. Thank you so much, Martine. Uh, Sue Ann? You there? Sorry, just to, uh, had to unmute a second. So my question was for Dr. Lin, who um, had to do with the blackout data that you presented. I wondered if you had looked at any of the other reasons for um, hospitalizations related to people on uh, respiratory devices, ventilators and such, who don't have adequate battery backup or other sources of energy. We, we did look at this during Hurricane Sandy um, and found a, a, a real disparity um, and a high prevalence of um, negative health outcomes be, uh, for those people who are on ventilators or respiratory support systems. Yeah, I think this is a very good point. So I didn't mention that. Yeah, we, we present this uh, in a multiple conference. I think the people mentioned that. I think this is a very good point. We do found that uh, we didn't do any study but we did find um, like the uh, uh, probably for COPD and like renal failure. So all these uh, cases increase probably due to the, the just access to the electricity. Yeah, I think you, you, you're right. Yeah, appreciate it. Great, thank you. Jen, do you have a question for Pauline? Sure, thank you. Um, my question was uh, just about whether or not maternal asthma severity played a role in children's health outcomes and you know whether it was based on whether they had really serious asthma and whether that correlated with the children having more severe health conditions or whether it was just asthma in general. So the data that I presented from our study is asthma in general. So just yes, no, and that all different types and severity of asthma, but it does appear to us and we're following up with a clinical study that there are endotypes and phenotypes of asthma that may be associated with more risk in children. So those would be things like um, defects in, in surfactant genes that may impact both mom and baby or other autoimmune pathways that impact both mom and baby. So those may end up being more severe. But the data I showed is sort of the generic um, scenario, just asthma in general. Thank you. Any more questions? No. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for such an excellent panel. It was really interesting uh, talk. So thank you all very much. Uh, and now we're going to move on to the next set of the uh, talk. Uh, our next speaker is Tia um, Palermo, who is Associate Professor 
in the Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health. Prior year, she joined us. She was a social policy manager and social protection at UNICEF uh, when she led a research examining linkage between the social policy, uh, poverty, and the health with the focus on the children and adolescent. Uh, today, her talk will be strengthening the adolescent um, capability. Welcome, Tia. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. Today, I'm gonna shift course a little bit. As Lena, uh, Lena mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a different phase of the life cycle, uh, namely adolescence. Now I'm gonna zoom into the experiences in one country, Tanzania. The study that I'm gonna be talking about today, Ujana Salama is Swahili for safe youth. And our study team is comprised of individuals from a number of organizations, including here at UB, UNICEF, our local partner in Tanzania, EDI Global, as well as two government agencies in Tanzania, the Tanzania Social Action Fund and the Tanzania Commission for AIDS. In Tanzania, the youth population, which the government defines as those between the ages of 15 and 34, is expected to almost double between 2015 and 2025. Adolescents face many risks in Tanzania, including those related to poverty, early pregnancy and marriage, violence, HIV, and a lack of livelihood opportunities. Just to give you an example, one in three girls in Tanzania is married before the age of 18, and among those who are currently 20 to 24 years old, 43% of them gave birth before the age of 18. HIV is a risk and girls are more likely than boys to be infected. So investments made in this period of adolescence can have benefits both at the micro or individual level, but also at the macro level. Adolescence is posited to represent a unique window of opportunity and in investments in adolescence are often referred to as having a triple dividend. That's because investments in adolescence incur benefits today in those adolescents' future life and also in the next generation of their children. There are many gender-related vulnerabilities that are exacerbated during adolescence. So for example, um, once girls reach puberty, they start to face vulnerabilities related to reproductive health, including early pregnancy and marriage. But adolescence is also a time when gender socialization starts to intensify. And what this means is that it's a time when gender inequities begin to manifest and they start to constrain opportunities, particularly for girls. Investing in adolescence has benefits not only at the individual level, but also at the macro level for countries as a whole. Like many African countries, Tanzania is still in the phase of its demographic transition where mortality is declining, but fertility is still high. So as fertility starts to decline, the country will experience smaller birth cohorts and then the proportion of the working age population will grow. And this presents for countries a one-time opportunity for both poverty reduction and accelerated economic growth. What is needed to realize this demographic dividend is investments in health and education, in public infrastructure, and enabling labor market conditions which facilitate labor-intensive growth and also for countries to implement good government practices for achieving sustainable economic and social development. Two important ways that governments can contribute to achieving the first aim investment in health and education is through social protection, but also complementary strengthening of both the quality and the availability of schools and health services. Social protection is defined as the set of policies and programs which are aimed at preventing poverty, vulnerability, and social exclusion across the life cycle. One way countries can ensure this demographic dividend is through investing in adolescents to break this intergenerational cycle of poverty and prepare the next generation for both a healthy and a productive adulthood. Because social protection addresses poverty, 
which is an upstream determinant of health, then social protection can also have secondary effects on broader outcomes, which are often determined by poverty. In order to safely transition to a healthy and productive adulthood, adolescents need strengthened capabilities across a range of dimensions, and those are listed on the screen here. A capabilities approach is a framework which highlights the multidimensional aspects of, that expand the capacity of individuals to achieve valued ways of doing and being. It has a core, at its core, has a sense of competence and purpose of agency and emphasizes individuals. It emphasizes investments in individual skills, knowledge, and voice. Social protection is one way to enhance these capabilities. One type of social protection program that is increasingly common are cash transfers. And these can mitigate some of the risks related to upstream determinants of health and expand adolescents' capabilities. In recognition of this capabilities enhancing framework, there have been a number of bundled interventions across Africa targeted to adolescent girls, which combine both health and economic strengthening components. And these interventions to a large extent have been on a small scale and are either run by researchers or non-governmental organizations. The intervention I'm gonna talk about today is the only government run program targeted to adolescents leveraging a large scale national social protection platform. So as I mentioned, cash transfers are one type of social protection program and they include a lot of different programs such as social insurance schemes, labor market policy, subsidies, school feeding, different types of economic transfers, and also cash transfers. As of 2018, cash transfers were a substantial and growing share of the global social safety net, including in lower and middle income countries. As of 2018, approximately 11% of the population in lower and middle income countries was covered by at least one social protection program. And what's important about these programs, particularly cash transfers, is that they are pro-poor. They reach a large share of poor populations within countries, and therefore they have robust interest from stakeholders given both the broad impacts of cash transfers, but also the cost effectiveness in their implementation for reducing poverty and food insecurity. Their scale makes it important to understand their impacts on secondary outcomes, which may not be the primary objectives of these anti-poverty programs, but given the fact that they're addressing poverty, which is an upstream determinant of health, they very likely have impacts on other secondary outcomes. In the context of COVID-19, social protection has been very important. So you can see from the graph here between March and December of 2020, over 1,400 social protection measures and programs were implemented in 215 countries and territories. About a third of these social protection measures were cash transfers, such as the payments that were made to Americans. And this context of COVID-19 and the importance of social protection in responding to the economic effects of COVID-19 adds motivation for understanding how cash transfers can affect adolescent well-being. The idea that household targeted anti-poverty programs such as cash transfers can have positive effects for adolescents, even if the adolescents are not the individuals being targeted for these programs, stems from the knowledge that many adverse outcomes and risk behaviors in adolescents are often driven by poverty and its consequences such as food insecurity. Motivated by the understanding that adolescents are a key population for breaking the intergenerational cycle of poverty, we did an evaluation of a large scale cash transfer program implemented by the government of Tanzania. This program rolled out in 2015 and reached 1 million households nationally. We did a randomized control trial to examine the effects of this cash transfer program on adolescent and youth well-being. And what we found is that there were positive impacts among adolescents and youth on the capacity to meet basic needs, their social support, their decision-making, schooling attendance, literacy, and school attainment. However, there were many outcomes that were not 
affected. And this includes early marriage and pregnancy, many health outcomes and livelihood opportunities for adolescents. So what this suggests is that cash is important, but not sufficient to address all the barriers that adolescents face in transitioning safely from adolescence to adulthood. It also suggests that powerful synergies can be created when linking adolescents in these cash transfer households to other services and interventions. This leads us to the next study that we implemented in collaboration with government. So this study is the Ujana Salama or a cash plus model. And we call it cash plus because we targeted adolescents who are living in those households that are receiving the government cash transfer. So these are among the poorest 10% of the population living in households which are already being targeted with this anti-poverty cash transfer program. The additional layered intervention targeted to adolescents comprised of face-to-face -face training in livelihoods and sexual and reproductive health and rights, nine months of mentorship and coaching, a productive grant worth approximately 80 US dollars, and referrals to strengthened health services. So in this way, we address not only demand side barriers, but also supply side barriers, where the Ministry of Health with technical assistance from UNICEF went in and did training with government primary health care facilities to make them more adolescent friendly. We did another RCT, a cluster RCT of this intervention, and we had 130 villages. We followed 2,191 youth um, five times now between 2017 and 2021. The study is a mixed method study, including both quantitative and qualitative methods, and we conducted surveys with youth, with household heads, community leaders, and also health facilities. So we have a rich combination of data on both health and economic aspects of adolescents' lives. What we found is that the intervention led to an increase in business startups, livestock keeping, which is an important livelihood activity in this context, their expectations to own a business. However, among a small sample of older females, we found an unintended consequence where there was an increase in school dropout. We found no impacts on outcomes such as grade attainment and hazardous work. When we looked at other dimensions, including knowledge, attitudes, health, and violence, we found that there were increases in self-esteem, gender equitable attitudes, knowledge, of contraception and HIV prevention, as well as HIV testing. We also found a delay in sexual debut among girls. However, we found no impacts on many of the outcomes listed on the right-hand side. But we did find protective effects against depressive symptoms and sexual violence, and a reduction in perpetration of physical violence perpetrated by males. Some of the implementation aspects that led to this successful study implementation was strong government ownership of the program, local and frequent dissemination of our findings, including in Swahili, good community involvement where we paid attention to the local context, we addressed linkages to health services, and the mentors were trusted adults in the local community. The study has had a lot of ongoing influence, including other programming of UN agencies around gender sensitive and HIV sensitive social protection. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tia. Uh, now we'll leave all the questions when we do the panel discussion. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jennifer Temper, who is the professor in the Department of Exercise and Nutrition and Community Health and Health Behavior, and also the director uh, of the Nutrition and House Research Laboratory at UB. Um, and her research focuses on factors influence ingestive behavior in adolescents. Um, and today her talk will be Adolescent House Behavior Challenges and Opportunities. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. Hopefully this will work. Yep. Okay, can everybody hear me, see my screen? I'm apologizing in advance for dogs and children because I'm working from home. So I'd like to thank um, everyone for inviting me here to, um, to give this talk, to talk a little bit about my work. So I'm gonna jump right into it. 
Um, my lab has been studying behavior, primarily focused on ingested behavior across the lifespan, but we focused on the adolescent period in particular for the last 15 years. And one of the reasons for this is that adolescence is a really dynamic period um, for a number of reasons. So first, it is a period of really rapid physical development. So adolescents undergo rapid growth and pubertal development. Um, these changes are also associated with a lot of health behavior changes, um, including changes in eating and physical activity. Adolescence is also a period of cognitive development. Um, there are changes in brain regions that are associated with reward and reinforcement and also with executive function. So regulating things like planning and impulsivity. Um, this cognitive development is also tied to changes in emotional development with a change in ability to both express emotion as well as control emotion. Uh, adolescents also begin to develop their own unique moral code that informs their priorities, their activities, and their interactions. Social development during the adolescent time period shifts from um, being related mostly to parents and caregivers to, um, to peer socialization and peer social interactions where peer interactions really take priority over other types of social interactions. Um, and then um, there's also personal changes that happen. So there are changes in independence and autonomy that um, can really change the way in which adolescents interact with the world. And these changes happen kind of later in adolescent development and in emerging adulthood. So there are some challenges with studying adolescents. Um, so one of the first challenges is that they have a limited time perspective. So this, this really means that they have a difficult time kind of placing themselves in very far in the future. They're very present oriented. Um, and this is related to their impulse behavior. Um, and so it makes, it makes it difficult to, to change health behavior when the focus is on things that are going to impact their lives far away in the future. Again, they also have a strong peer influence. So they may be less likely to, to listen to or model the behaviors of adults um, and, and may be more likely to, to follow their peers or to be in tune with their peers. As I mentioned earlier, from a neurobiological perspective, uh, one of the challenges is that the reward centers of the adolescent brain are very mature. So they're very in tune to reward and reinforcement but the executive function centers of the brain are still underdeveloped and they develop actually into the early 20s. So this means that the adolescent brain is really primed to respond to rewards and they're not particularly good at inhibiting their behaviors. Um, and again, rapid growth and pubertal development can present a challenge, especially for those of us that are interested in health behaviors. So because adolescence is a time where um, absolute energy needs are the highest, it may be difficult to talk to adolescents about eating healthier or maybe even eating less or eating different kinds of foods because they, they physically need more food and they might feel more physically hungry. There are also some opportunities with studying adolescents that we've, we've really tried to capture. Um, one is the adolescent behavior and habits track into adulthood. So this is really a time where if you can encourage adolescents to adopt healthier behaviors, it may have a, a long-term impact on their health that goes into adulthood. Um, addressing poor health behaviors early can keep from creating a bigger problem. So it's much easier to prevent um, something like excess weight gain um, if you start prior to that weight gain in childhood or adolescence, rather than start in adulthood when weight gain has already occurred to try and get people to lose weight. So, so adopting a more prevention mindset or prevention strategy is possible in adolescence and it may become more challenging later on in adulthood. There's also an opportunity to leverage this um, unique development period um, to, to make changes. Um, and so, as I mentioned uh, um, earlier, you know, adolescence is a time where, where peer influence is really um, critical. So it's possible that we could, we could leverage that and use peers as models or peer facilitators in some kind of behavior change intervention. So understanding and recognizing the, the uniqueness of the adolescent development period and then using that to our advantage. So if we think about um, healthy eating in particular, which is what um, one of the things my lab is really interested in, 
Um, adolescents have a really good understanding of what foods are healthy and what foods are not healthy. So it's not that adolescents really lack that knowledge. It's much more about motivating them to, to make the healthier choices. Again, adolescents are undergoing rapid growth and development, which requires a lot of energy, which actually can buffer them from um, some of the concerns about consuming too much energy. So we may be able to focus on diet quality and eating a healthier diet and not so much on restricting or, or creating the idea that there are some foods that are off limits or forbidden. And this really works within the adolescent brain because we don't have to focus so much on inhibition or restraint of behavior, which they're not particularly good at. We can focus more on adapting healthier behaviors. Um, we also, in terms of healthy eating, um, we can leverage some values of adolescents to motivate them to engage in, um, in healthier eating. So the adolescents really value autonomy and independence they value peer influence. They might value other things like sports participation, physical appearance, physical appearance, and not just weight. We try really hard not to focus on weight, but things like having healthy skin that we can tie into eating a healthy diet. Um, adolescents also develop this sense of social justice that can be um, tied into working on some health behavior change interventions. So traditional eating or healthy eating interventions um, that are often done in adults focus on weight loss, they tend to include some component of restriction or restraint. So there are foods that we're trying to reduce or limit, foods um, that, are, that are potentially off limits. Um, in addition, traditional eating interventions tend to be focused on health-related issues. So either focusing on body weight or focusing on reduction in prediabetes or cardiovascular disease risk or hypertension, these are things that do not resonate with the adolescent population. So we, it's very challenging to take health behavior interventions or eating interventions in particular that we use in adult populations and just apply them to adolescent populations. They're not particularly successful. Adolescent healthy eating interventions have to really focus on the unique adolescent time period and, and be in tune with what is important to the adolescent population. So this is not a study that we did, but, um, but it really ties into kind of where my lab is going. Um, so this was a study by um, Brian and colleagues and they, they were really looking at healthy eating interventions and trying to, to do exactly what I said. So let's leverage what we know about what's important to adolescents to get them to eat healthier. So they, they emphasize two things. They emphasize um, independence and autonomy, and also um, they wanted to align with their values of social justice. And so they basically had an intervention where they framed healthy eating um, as a way to have autonomous food choice and also a way to fight back against the unfair practices of food manufacturers or the food industry. And so um, kids basically watched an expose about the food industry or they watched um, a control sort of traditional public health message. Um, and the kids that watched the expose came up, um, they, hate, they ate healthier, they made healthier snack choices, healthier beverage choices following the intervention. And they also endorsed um, things like, when I eat healthy, I'm doing my part to protect kids. Um, or um, I'm, when I eat healthy, I'm fighting against the controlling practices of the food companies. Um, when I choose to eat healthy, I'm making the world a better place. Um, and so this really, this intervention kind of empowered teens to make their own choices. And instead of framing it as you need to eat healthy because we're telling you to, or we're, you need to eat healthy because it's better for your long-term health. It was really about making them make the decision to eat healthier, feeling like they had control over it and doing it because they were um, creating a better world. So um, I'm gonna shift gears and talk specifically about what my lab has been doing in this realm. Um, so again, I'm the director of the Nutrition and Health Research Lab. And for the last five years, we have been conducting a study called the University at Buffalo Study of Nutrition and Activity in Kids or the UB SNAC study. Um, so this was really a study aimed at understanding behavioral um, and phen other phenotypic risk factors uh, for excess adolescent weight gain. Um, and so we study 12 to 14 year old adolescents at baseline and we followed them for two years. They had nine laboratory visits over that time period. 
we examined a lot of different factors. We were primarily focused on understanding the relative reinforcing value of healthy and unhealthy snacks and physical and sedentary activity. Um, so really understanding motivation. But we also, during the course of this study, became really interested in the idea of adolescent eating autonomy. And that's what I'm gonna spend the next few slides focused on. So this is really a project that is spearheaded by one of my PhD students, Amanda Ziegler. Um, she has been working with me for 10 years now, um, not as a PhD student, PhD student, she's only been for a couple years, but she's been working in this realm of understanding adolescent eating. And she really was interested in the idea that the adolescents um, individual decision making and perceptions of their control over their food choices might be related to the quality of their diet, as well as factors that influence their their body weight and their weight change over time. So she developed um, this model that's seen here that was adapted from um, food systems model to develop a framework for trying to understand adolescent eating autonomy. Um, and so um, she, she conducted focus groups um, right before the pandemic. Um, so luckily we finished um, focus groups at the end of 2019. And um, she was very careful to focus on um, recruiting a diverse population of adolescents from different geographic regions. So we had representation from rural, suburban, and urban populations in Buffalo, and a good mix of um, racial and um, ethnic minorities to, to majorities. Um, and she was really interested in just talking to them about their autonomous eating experiences. And through this um, qualitative analysis, um, she was able to identify five areas where um, adolescents had varying degrees of autonomy. So meal planning, food preparation and cooking, grocery planning and shopping, independent food acquisition and independent food purchasing. And within this, she also was able to identify factors that promoted eating autonomy. So having more time to be independent, time with peers, um, higher parental trust and approval and effective negotiation strategies. And she also found that there were things that inhibited adolescent eating autonomy. So things like high levels of parental control and restriction um, and limited um, ability to spend money. So um, she, she recently had this um, paper accepted for publication um, and we're really using this as a foundation of the next steps in our lab, which is to develop a novel questionnaire to assess the construct of eating autonomy. Um, so right now we um, are developing and refining an eating autonomy questionnaire based on the data from the focus groups. Um, the next step is to validate the questionnaire um, which we are also working on. And then the goal is to really have this novel assessment tool to determine the extent to which adolescent eating autonomy relates to eating behavior, energy intake, diet quality, and weight and weight change over time. And the goal would be to determine if eating autonomy is a potential, um, potential intervention um, point um, that we could use for either a harm reduction target or some kind of um, healthy eating intervention. So can we leverage this idea of eating autonomy um, to encourage adolescents to make healthier choices on their own? So just to wrap up, um, what I've hopefully convinced you of is that adolescence is an important developmental period that helps to establish adult health behavior. There's unique challenges and opportunities in studying the adolescent time period. Um, the adolescents care, care about health. It's not that they don't care about health or they don't understand the importance of healthy eating, but their motivations are different from adults. So we need to be in tune with those and we need to be able to leverage um, those unique experiences. Um, autonomy and independence are two key they can and should be leveraged in behavior change and health promote messages. Apparently things are completely melting down at my house. Dogs are barking, the kids are running around. So um, this is my final slide where I think um, Amanda and the rest of the students in my lab who have helped with this project and our collaborators, uh, Lucia Leone um, and her graduate student, Christina um, Kasprazek and our funding from the NIH. And I think we're saving questions for the panel. Hopefully I can usher everyone outside. Um. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jen, for such an interesting talk. We have a question here in, in the chat. Uh, Jen, you want to uh, talk about your question? 
Yeah, I found it really interesting when you talked about how teenagers um, base some of their ideas about eating and nutrition around ideas of social justice and environmental justice. So I was wondering what role social media played in their perceptions of both that and their perceptions of nutrition and how the two are perhaps interrelated if you've, if you've come across that in your research. You know, that's a really good question. Um, so we haven't, my research hasn't really explored the, the role of social media or the impact of social media. Clearly there is an impact. Um, and there are a lot of other labs that are, that are, that are working on questions like that. Um, but I think any potential intervention that comes of this has to leverage social media and has to really be aware of, I, I should have actually added that as an influence because it's, it's sort of, it's sort of beyond peer influence or it's like, it's like ultra peer influence, right? Not just their immediate peers and their friends at school, but like their peers in the social media realm that has such a heavy influence on, um, on their behavior, but even on their sense of social justice, they're just kind of tied into, um, these, these larger issues. And, um, and so I, I don't have a good sense of how, of how that plays a role, but we know that it plays a role. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you so much, Jen. Um, so since we're talking about uh, raising a healthy generation, so one important topic we have to discuss that is how this pandemic might affect the future generations. So I'll introduce our next speaker, Dr. Oscar um, Gomez, who is the chief uh, of the Division Pediatric Infectious Disease and Associate Professor of the Pediatric at UB. And she, uh, he leads um, multiple global health research program, also oversee the um, Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellowship Program and teach trainings in medicine and biomedical research. And today he will discuss with us uh, COVID-19 impact on children. Welcome, Oscar. You're on mute. Okay, thank you very much for the kind invitation for me to participate in this forum. Um, what I will uh, do today is um, uh, will tell you about uh, uh, the effect of COVID-19 on children and some of this information is something that uh, I have been a witness as a physician uh, working at Children's Hospital and in different clinics. Uh, and also <clears throat> based on the work that my team has been conducting at uh, different levels uh, and, and, uh, on this uh, disease. Um, uh, also, I'm bringing basically summaries of information that is out there in, in the uh, headline, uh, which I think is only showing us the tip of the iceberg of the uh, problem that uh, uh, we are facing and that uh, children will basically face in the future. Um, so with this in mind, I, um, when I start my presentation, um, so I'm basically gonna talk uh, briefly about uh, what are the clinical considerations of this disease in children and then the effect on healthcare, education, social interactions food security, nutrition, poverty, mental health. And then I will try to uh, finish with some uh, hope. Uh, so my talk will not be very uh, negative at the end. Um, so anyway, we have learned a lot about uh, this disease. We know how it looks. So, you know, we know how, um, how many proteins it make and how it gets into the system, how it replicates and, and cause disease. Um, and uh, it, we know that the infections happen at every age group. And as you can see in this figure, the, these lines in yellow, which corresponds to a children age group, zero to five, um, 14 to 17, uh, have been increasing in numbers along this pandemic. Um, uh, however, 
the number of hospitalizations that happen among children, fortunately, has not been as high as we have seen in older age groups uh, above 18 years of age, certainly above 50 years of age. Similarly, uh, the deaths that happen uh, in, in the general population in the US have been, again, mainly above 80 years of age, above 65 years of age, and have been minimally in, in, the, in the children population, uh, which is good. So the only death that happen in this age group tend to be children that have some type of comorbidities, which may include asthma, may include obesity, may include sickle cell disease, um, and so on. Um, now we know already a lot about this disease and what kind of you know, uh, manifestations it has uh, in children. Uh, it is important uh, to notice that 19.2% of children uh, less than 18 years of age do not have any symptoms. And among the, of those that have symptoms, uh, they may have either fever, 50% uh, of the cases, cough, 44% of the cases, they may affect other organs. But again, uh, uh, the, 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 the dramatic effects tend to happen in the adult population. It is something that is interesting among children and it's a, a, a different syndrome, which is not related to the replication of the virus in the system, um, but it's rather a response of the individual uh, to, 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 this, to this virus, which is uh, given the name of multisystem inflammatory syndrome or MIS-C, which is associated with COVID. Uh, so that tend to happen in less than 21 years of age. It's associated initially with fever. Uh, there is evidence of inflammation and may affect different organs, uh, predominantly gastrointestinal uh, tract, uh, the skin, the cardiac uh, system, and the kidneys. Um, in general, uh, this individual may have antibodies to the to the to the virus. May have, in some cases, a positive test for the virus, uh, but in general, uh, this disease happen later after they have already recovered from the viral infection. Uh, this is a graph that basically shows the, the peaks of uh, either active infection with COVID or this uh, MIS-C syndrome, uh, uh, which again, tend to increase uh, depending on how the population is having infections and tend to kind of, uh, the peaks of MIS-C tend to uh, be posterior as the peak of infection. Now, <clears throat> Let's now concentrate on other aspects, which are probably the ones that are more dramatic and are affecting children uh, uh, more significantly. And, and that is the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on pediatric healthcare services. So because of the pandemic, either because uh, the restrictions, the lockdowns, uh, uh, the inability of medical services to be provided for different reasons, there have been a, 7.6 million less dental services rendered according with the data from the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid. 3.2 million less child screen services provided. Um, 6.9 million fewer outpatient mental health services and 1.7 million less vaccinations given to children up to the age of two. I have also data uh, on, on the immunization from the uh, Michigan uh, state. And as you can see, basically, this is a comparison of immunizations given from 2016 to 2020. The 2020 here labeled in black uh, clearly shows that uh, for children uh, three months of age, five months of age, seven months of 16, there was a significant decrease in the vaccination given. And this, again, this is an, one example of Michigan, but this happened pretty much all across the United States. Uh, one aspect that, of course, is has been in the news every single day has been the effect of COVID-19 on childhood education and well-being, specifically related to the school closures. So that, this is something that, of course, we haven't seen in many decades and that has significantly affected uh, the children population, not only because of the answers of, of education opportunity, but also the deprivations in, in, in the social structure, the inability to see friends, the inability to see their teacher, the inability to see 
uh, and share with other people. Um, now, schools, not only in the United States, but in all over the world, have been essential uh, means to provide nutrition uh, to children, especially from the low economic backgrounds. So that, of course, has been affected. Um, uh, limited adult guidance, of course, and all of these deprivations uh, uh, tend to affect the children from the underserved uh, background. Um, this is a map of uh, the school closures in dark blue uh, and partially open uh, uh, countries in, in light blue by March 2020. So as you can see, there was a significant effect that happened all over the world. And then the, the effects of this in the future are still unknown, uh, but it's certainly something that is still affecting uh, many, many countries because not all of the countries have actually opened uh, the schools. This is another graph that basically shows uh, the percentage of students potentially reached by digital or uh, remote broadcasting. Uh, and again, I'm not, this graph doesn't show United States or Europe, um, but even, even in this case, even though there is a possibility of getting access to internet, the fact is that many families cannot afford to pay for the services. And in, in that particular case, also the United States uh, is being affected, and especially the poor families that cannot afford uh, internet may have significant limitations in access. Um, so that also has significantly affected even those families that couldn't, couldn't have children go to school. Uh, but cannot also cannot even afford uh, 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 having children uh, getting access to classes by internet. Uh, now this is uh, on on the question: of What happened uh, on malnutrition and nutrition-related mortality? So there are interesting uh, things on these aspects: the economic, food, health system disruptions. And resulting from the pandemic are expected to exacerbate all forms of malnutrition. Uh, a, a, according with this study, uh, basically estimates suggest that additional 140 million people will live in extreme poverty in 2020 and probably 2021. Uh, the World for Food Program uh, indicated that the number of people in low and middle income countries facing acute food insecurity will nearly double. And uh, it is expected that there will be child declines in expected access uh, to children's health and nutrition services. So we have here one uh, example of one study that was done in Bangladesh. And in this particular study, basically, they were uh, uh, determining um, benefits of uh, and risk of iron intervention. So they did one study at the beginning of this. At the period and at the end of the period and during this period that was pre-COVID, uh, the food security of these families was above eighty percent uh, in both periods. However, when when these uh, numbers were also uh, checked during the lockdown, uh, the 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 percentage of families that had food security decreased significantly to only. 30%. And again, this may have happened uh, across many low and middle income countries, and this information is just coming out. Um, what about poverty? So one important aspect, first of all, is that children comprise 23% of the US population, and 32% of them live in poverty. Also, an important uh, statistic is that parents of children lacking economic security comprise the low income essential workforce that keep our society functional. Now, during the pandemic, uh, this population resulted in a cascade of job losses, erosion of families, financial insecurity, food insecurity, and loss of health insurance. This is data uh, that basically shows the, the monthly poverty rate um, based on um, uh, race and ethnicity. And you can see um, the, uh, these rates of poverty were lower among the white and Asian population. They were mainly affecting the Hispanic and African-American population. This decrease in the rate of poverty basically refers to the uh, stimulus check that came from the government to this family. But again, this immediately went up uh, shortly after an increase above the baseline uh, level. 
Um, this is a graph uh, mainly talking about the children in low and middle income countries uh, that at the baseline before the pandemic uh, were in a 582 million children living in poverty and that number jumped more than 100 million in 2020 and will probably remain high in 2021. Um, what about uh, the impact on child exclusion, mental health and abuse? Uh, of, of course, as uh, we may have seen the, the number of children experiencing parent dying or grandparents dying is amazingly high. Uh, just in the United States, this, it's an estimate of 37,000 to 40,000 uh, already affected. Um, one in seven children and young uh, people have lived under stay-at-home policies for most of last year, leading to feelings of anxiety, depression, and isolation. And among refugees and asylum seekers from 59 countries are unable to access a COVID-19 related social protection due to border closures or rising xenophobia and exclusion. This is a data that was just published in JAMA and uh, referring to the number of, the estimated number of uh, uh, children left uh, without parents or, or guardians because uh, they died during the pandemic. Uh, these numbers uh, refers to deaths in which it was caused by COVID-19 or you know, the other number is the estimated excess of deaths, some of which may also have been related to COVID-19. So these numbers are very high and tend to affect predominantly children between 10 to 17 years of age, the adolescent group. Uh, and this probably is relates, uh, and this graph relates to the, to the previous one. And in this one, basically what's, what we see is the proportion of mental health related emergency visits um, uh, for mental health issues. And as you can see, this is a comparison between 2019 and 2020. And as you can see, the, the number is, is clearly significant. And this is probably gonna continue uh, uh, over this year. Um, this is another graph, which is also very dramatic. And this graph basically what uh, the authors are showing is the rate of sentinel injury in children. What is sentinel injury? Basically are injuries that probably happen due to uh, abuse, uh, either by parents, by guardians, or by other people. So as you can see during this period from April to July uh, last year, this number of sentinel injuries increased significantly. And there have been also reports of a, a child abuse that had happened during this period and all of the factors that may be related to this. Now, <clears throat> again, um, we, we know we, we will know more about this, but I want to finish my presentation by saying that uh, certainly uh, there is hopefully a, a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that education guidance to parents will be very important. Certainly the COVID-19 vaccines already approved and that will be a, a, in the future approved for children less than 16 years of age will hopefully will make it a big difference. The safe school opening uh, virtually or physically certainly will help many of these children to go back uh, to pre-COVID times, and hopefully uh, this will continue, not only this day, but in many other countries. So basically, in summary, we can say that COVID has really affected children across the globe. Uh, it has the clinical manifestation of acute um, uh, in, uh, COVID-19 or the MIS-C are known. Fortunately, the effect on hospitalizations and deaths is significantly lower than in the other population. COVID-19 restrictions has severely affected the economy and increased poverty levels in the community. Closure of school, schools have critically affected education, nutrition, and social development. Isolation, stress, limited mobility has increased the rate of mental illness among children and the rate of child abuse. And we are hoping that measures to limit the impact uh, will include education, social opening, and vaccines. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Oscar, for such an insightful uh, presentation. Uh, any question for the talk? 
So I actually have a question. It's more clarification. So one of the slides you presented about the uh, people have the mental health issue and visit to the ER that increase was actually um, striking to me. Um, were those are the um, children or uh, adults? Uh, in this uh, graph, they show um, uh, predominantly adolescents and, and adults. Adolescents and, and adults. Right. So both, okay. All right. Um, and another thing I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what do you think the long-term impact that, that can be for the, from the pandemic? Uh, to the children who experience this pandemic? Yeah, I think that the pandemic has affected children significantly uh, in many aspects. And the closure of the schools is something that is unprecedented. And then um, uh, the, the inability for them to interact with other children, the inability to interact with other adults, the um, Inability in many of the in many of the children to actually be in contact with the schools uh, is certainly dramatic. Um, the effect of a, uh, of these cl school closures on families is also uh, significant. There have been many studies indicating how uh, stressful this could be for families, especially working families, and that is stress in certain populations may also be associated with, uh, uh, with child abuse because I mean, I guess the, the stress of not being working, the stress of having uh, many children at home, the, the stress of not having a, you know, a financial security, nutrition security, uh, a, elevate the stress in families to the point that uh, they will have a, a bad consequences in this population. Um, so again, uh, I'm, I know that many people are studying this aspect and there will be more information coming up. Uh, and it's, I'm really curious what is gonna happen uh, on, on these children from in two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any question for uh, Dr. Temper and uh, um, our panel speakers? You can just unmute yourself and directly speak up if you do have questions. Second. Looks like we have no more questions. All right. Okay, thank you all very, very much for, uh, for all our speakers today and Dr. Martina, uh, Larry Head, Dr. Um, Pauline Mendola, Dr. Shaolin, and uh, Tia uh, Plamo, Dr. Jennifer Temple, and Oscar uh, gosmes uh, for all your excellent um, speech today on such a crucial uh, in, uh, global health issue. We also want to thank you, our UB uh, community for Global Health Equity co-sponsored the event. Uh, and I also want to thank you, all of you, for attending the event. Thank you so much. With that, we'll close today's symposium. Thank you all. Hope you all take care. Thank you.